Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to, to, to Russ, to Masha, to everybody for, for, for inviting us. It really is a pleasure to be here in a, in a form of porn theatre as well. So, you know, um, this, this trip is uh, exciting on, on, many, on many levels. Um, but yeah, so I'm Johnny Walker. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking a little bit about a project that I'm currently investigating uh, about British horror cinema in the 1980s and 90s. Two decades which are rarely considered, um, well, it's certainly not a golden age of, of British horror production, uh, that 20-year period. But nonetheless, um, things were happening and things were interesting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, uh, today. And I also want to say thanks to, to Russ uh, once again for allowing me to use his Tinder profile picture on the, on the, on the front. <laughs> so, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Russ. <laughs> okay. well, yeah, I'll start as we mean to go on, everyone. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so in 1979, which is a, is a significant year because that is the year that Hammer Films, which of course is uh, Britain's uh, biggest uh, production house of horror films, Hammer Films closed its doors, citing uh, the withdrawal of American subsidy and also declining cinema audiences in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom. And this is of course right as home video was taking off, so cinema audiences certainly, uh, certainly were hit. Now, for many commentators, Hammer's demise sounded the death knell of uh, British horror film production, or at least prior to the post-2000s revival of the genre with films like 28 Days Later, and I guess The Woman in Black and Censor, and all of these other films that are, that are making big, big business at the moment. But as is documented elsewhere, in the 1980s, State funding streams for domestic film production, whether they be horror films or comedies or, or whatever, all but dissipated. And for the handful of organisations that were committed to supporting the industry at this time, horror is a genre now associated with British cinema's disreputable past fell far beyond notions of quality that such organisations wished to court. Yet despite this, numerous domestic horror productions did materialise throughout the decade, enjoying various levels of success and international exposure. So if this is British horror of the past, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and so on and so forth, the films that materialised in the 1980s were somewhat different, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Now, the most notable academic studies about British cinema in the 1980s tend to place horror at the periphery of analysis, uh, to say the least, or mention the genre across one or two sentences. The reasons for this likely relate, relate to the fact that fewer horror films were produced in Britain during this period than in previous decades, and that of those films released theatrically during this time, only a handful managed to generate significant box office returns, and, mostly, uh, and most of them fared poorly with the critics. Many were also released direct to video, um, which you may well know is a stigmatized um, arena of production. Nobody really wants their film, even today, I guess, nobody really wants their films being released direct to video, even though, of course, that's the, we, we all consume most of our films, I guess, streaming now. But certainly in the, in the 80s and 90s, most people were watching films um, on, on VHS, not, not, not at, at the cinema. And in Britain specifically, we had the Video Nasties Panic which, um, to give a little potted history of that, is when video first came out, um, conservative politicians and other cultural case makers were concerned that kids could now access horror films, and as a consequence, everybody lost their minds and 39 films were banned. Um, so this is the context that um, horror film makers in Britain are working in the 1980s, when essentially everybody is saying that horror is a horrible genre and we should really want very little to do with it, if, if anything at all. So in this context, the horror genre was rarely viewed you know, by people who really wanted to make British cinema an important thing. It was rarely, rarely viewed as the, the go-to genre, given that it was associated with the video nasties and past British cinema, such as Hammer films, that people were keen to forget. So, to this end, within discourse, and I'll get to the point in a second, within discourse surrounding British film production of the 1980s, um, 
there tends to be, at this time, emphasis placed on two types of film. So the people who are talking about British cinema have an idea of what British cinema should be, and it should not be horror cinema. It should be, for example, large-scale commercial features, such as good, wholesome family entertainment, such as Superman the movie, which is a, which is a British film. Not many people know that. Alien, which of course is a... Is a science fiction horror film, but by the same token, it's directed by Ridley Scott, who shot at Pinewood Studios, it has a budget, Bond, Chariots of Fire, all these films that uh, people were going to the cinema to see, and which the film industry could be proud of, because Bond is a cultural institution, Superman is a, is a worldwide icon, etc. So this is one example of what people thought British cinema should be, large-scale commercial features, on the other hand, we have small-scale, experimental, or radical features. You know, art films, f films that have something to say, made for very little money, have a very sectionalized audience, don't make a lot of money, but which nevertheless, the industry is, it's important for the industry to be seen to be supporting this kind of thing because it's broadly reflective of the, the culture of the period and, and so on. Um, and if this is what people were saying British cinema should be. Um, horror's not going to fall w within that. And in fact, two modes of exhibition were championed. Firstly, theatrical exhibition. And secondly, for small-scale films such as this, TV. Video just didn't come into it at all. The home video market and horror films is a viable means of income generation for the film industry, and what I'm going to be exploring today with you in laborious detail, um, was overlooked completely. So it's my contention that in sidestepping horror films, in sidestepping the video market, um, film producers, or rather case makers who were talking about British cinema, were overlooking a middle ground of, of, of film production, what we might call small-scale commercial features. Those independent films in the horror genre that, okay, might not be setting the box office on fire, might not be making a ton of money, but which were nevertheless seen and enjoyed by um, a good number of people, largely on, on video. Now, it's well documented elsewhere how well low-budget exploitation films did on video. And this included all, 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 all types of, of horror films, including British productions, such as the output of Hammer from the 50s, for instance, um, which despite the studio's closure in the 70s, continued to make money on video. Numerous other British films from the 70s as well also found footing in this marketplace, as well as others from the era that were still playing in cinemas. So while some theatrical distributors were concerned about the effect that video was gonna have on, on the film business, and you know, they were, they were right to be, to, be, um, to be concerned about declining cinema audiences and stuff. Others just hopped on board the video bad bandwagon, sort of cut their losses and thought, okay, well actually, maybe we should be turning to video, maybe that's where our future lies. So you have companies like Warner Brothers, for instance, who recognize that, okay, we can still make money from British horror films, even if it's the British horror films of old, such as the Satanic Rites of Dracula, as well as smaller independent companies such as Hockershin, which was one of the first independent video labels in Britain, which specialized in releasing, well, sex films and horror films, basically, but British horror films were part of that. And this company, Duran, which in the mid-1980s released, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this filmmaker, Pete Walker, does that ring a bell? No relation to me. Um, which is good, good or a bad thing, I, I don't know. But he was a, a very prolific filmmaker in the 1970s making horror and sexploitation films, which were doing well on video in the 1980s. And given that throughout the 1970s, the primary market for British-produced horror films was the UK itself, and chiefly in London, some producers recognised that a market sector worth exploiting further remained, even if this was primarily non theatrical, and there was lots of money to, to be made in video. Now, there are, a number, there are a number of films I could consider here, a number of British horror films made in the, in the 1980s that were responding to the popularity of, um, of home video. Uh, and one such film, which I'm not going to talk about, but I just want to mention, is The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. Now, this is not the type of film one would necessarily associate 
with, um, with British horror films, right? Peter Cushing isn't in it. Christopher Lee isn't in it. It's a sequel to a pretty successful American independent film, The Hills Have Eyes, right? But it was, in fact, a British production. It was shot in America, but it was funded largely by, by British sources, including this, this person here, Adrian Fancy, who is largely unknown anywhere else, but within the UK was one of the primary distributors of horror and sex films throughout, throughout London. And when the opportunity arose to make The Hills Have Eyes 2, she funneled, um, she funneled some money in to that. But The Hills of Ice 2 is one of many films we could discuss today, and it's not a one that I'm going to talk about um, very much at all. Uh, but rather, permit me, if you will, to hop aboard a one-horse open sleigh, join me in jingling those bells. <laughs> I mean, this is written down. Can you believe that? Um, as we examine... In laborious detail, a film that few people like, but which has an interesting production history, one of a handful of British set slasher films, Don't Open Till Christmas, from 1984. And this is the tagline for the film. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, everyone was dead. Uh, here is the trailer for Don't Open Till Christmas, and then we'll talk about it. present from the people who brought you Friday the 13th. Now comes Don't Open Till Christmas. A homicidal maniac is loose at Christmas. His target is Santa Claus. No one dressed as Santa Claus is safe. His death toys are a spear, a gun, an open razor, a dagger, or a garrote. Execution by any means. Don't open till Christmas. Some Santa Clauses ignore the warnings. He surely wouldn't attack a woman. <laughs> Don't open till Christmas with special guest star Carolyn Monroe. Terror drives one Santa Claus into a house of wax. Amidst the wax and plaster, a real body, warm flesh, wet blood. Don't open till Christmas. What possible reason could I have for going around killing Santas? Oh, none. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming to you. So, Sam, did you bring me any presents? I'm... I'm not the real one. Starring Edmund Purdom, who knows there are only three more killing days till Christmas. Don't open till Christmas. If you do, you may not see in the new year. This was pretty scary stuff. Um, so, no, but before we praise the film, um, some context is needed regarding its American producers um, and the factors that, that led them to... Um, to making it. Whereas many of the major American film studios had a base in London, I mean, it was, this is, will come as news to nobody, but a, a lot of the big major studios in America had a base in London. This was very, very common. What was less common, however, was for international producers of exploitation cinema to shoot films in the UK. That just was not um, a, thing, a thing that happened. Places such as the US which of course were a hub of enterprise with robust distribution networks and the likes of Italy, Spain and so on with their dynamic production cultures, striking landscapes and affordable studio spaces made the idea of the UK as a go-to for international exploitation producers somewhat redundant, not least because from the 50s to the 70s, as I mentioned earlier, Britain was, had a well-established cottage industry catering to local audiences. Um, Lots of different films, like this is just some examples of the types of um, British exploitation films one could expect um, between, the, between the 50s and the, in the 1970s. So where it was, it was uncommon for, say, American producers to shoot in Britain, 
there were, or to base themselves in Britain, there, there were some exceptions to the rule. Um, the producers of Don't Open Till Christmas, Dick Randall and Steve Manasian. Now, Dick Randall was American-born, um, and he co-produced in partnerships, uh, partnership with the Boston-based Steve Manasian a number of small-scale commercial features in Britain throughout the 1980s, of which Don't Open Till Christmas was the first. Ahead of making horror films in Britain, Randall and Manasian had decades' worth of experience between them, with long-established careers both as producers and distributors of low-budget films intended for a world wide audience. So, for example, um, Randall's experience extended back to the 60s, when from an office in Rome and under the umbrella of his company Spectacular Trading, which I think is somewhat of an overstatement given the films that he was pr producing, he began producing and distributing sex comedies, other sorts of exploitation films, um, all of which were promoted throughout the world in the similar commonplace exploitation style. Supersonic Man, for instance, was released just ahead of Superman the movie. Crocodile was made in response to Jaws and um, so on and so forth. So that's Dick Randall. Um, Steve Manasian, his co-producer, um, had different but related beginnings nonetheless, having begun his career in the 1960s as an exhibitor and a theater chain owner. But by the time he met Dick Randall uh, in the early 1980s, he had a decade of distribution and marketing under his belt uh, with his company Hallmark releasing. And, I, and when Don't Open Till Christmas was made, Manasian was pretty well known within his circles because he co-financed Last House on the Left and distributed it in the States. Um, he also distributed Mark of the Devil, the German film, um, and his campaign was to produce vomit bags so that when you went to see it in the States, you'd be given a, a vomit bag because you know you, were, you, you would definitely be sick when you, when you watched the film. Uh, and he also, uh, I just discovered, is responsible for that whole don't, don't look in the basement, don't open the window. That was his idea, and of course, don't open till Christmas is, is, a, is a continuation, a continuation of, of that. The fact that Don't Open Till Christmas was made in Britain then is largely circumstantial. Uh, during his time in Rome, Dick Randall did very well exploiting the booming trade in international exploitation uh, films, enabled by the cheap production and labour costs proffered by the Italian film industry. And indeed, it was precisely this context um, that Randall and Menasian's first film that they produced together, Pieces, emerged from in, in 1981, which was made to capitalise on the success of Friday the 13th, which Steve Manasian also part-financed. That, does that make sense? So Steve Manasian puts money into Friday the 13th and then sees this as an amazing opportunity to produce a similar film in Italy uh, for like a third of the budget, um, and Pieces is the result. Now, I don't have to show you a clip from Pieces, but I'd very much like to, if that's okay. Um, so let's see if this, if this works. So this is the opening scene of uh, Pieces. And if you haven't seen this film, I heartily recommend that you do. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a big fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put the pieces to. Where did this filth come from? <coughs> Answer me! Answer me! What I have to put up with? You dirty-minded little brat, playing with filth like this, just like your father. And you don't watch out. That's who you're gonna grow up like. And I can tell you a couple of things about him. Bastard! I'll kill you if I ever find stuff like that in the house again. Go get a plastic bag. I'm gonna burn everything. Don't just stand there! Go get a bag! I'm gonna put a stop to this once and for all. Oh, what a 
with magazines. Benny has more stuff all over the place. Hurry up, stupid, and bring me a plastic bag to junk this stuff. Uh, not going to win many awards, I don't think. Um, what, what I think is especially sort of humorous about that clip is that, of course, this film came out in 1981 when everybody was worried about children accessing horror films and then being inspired to do crazy things. Clearly, the, the real issue was pornographic jigsaws. That's where they should really have been uh, focusing their energy, perhaps. Um, so by 1982, for reasons which are unverifiable, please don't sue me for saying this, but which are rumoured to relate to Dick Randall owing debts to gangland types in Italy, uh, he relocated to London. Now, that, for all that Randall's arrival in the UK was sudden, and despite the fact that the domestic industry was not in the best of health, the move had little bearing on his and Manasian's production strategy that they initiated with, with pieces. As the US trade press noted at the time, Randall's, and I'm quoting here, his projects and acquisitions were principally earmarked for international marketing, irrespective of where in the world they were shot. So this meant, unlike the majority of their British contemporaries, who tended to make most of their money from British audiences, Randall and Manasian had no real reason to regard Britain as the primary outlet for their product, but rather as one territory in a list of many where they had established connections. So Don't Open Till Christmas is of particular interest to the film historian insofar as it embodies, perhaps more so than any horror film to emerge from Britain in the 1980s, a period of, of transition which sees the British film industry shift from relatively consistent local exploitation production to an era of global facing initiatives um, embodied by British horror filmmakers. So the film, which is ostensibly a slasher film, in which a faceless killer stalks people dressed as Santa Claus, um, which, to be clear, I've sort of written that, which makes it sound as if the killer is dressed as Santa Claus. He is not. He is killing people who are dressed as Santa Claus uh, for very interesting reasons, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, and it's one of several films made during this period, which, while financed by British companies, was chiefly made for exhibition overseas. However, what is especially curious is that whereas the film Pieces, despite it being this sort of Euro pudding, Spanish-Italian co-production, it is presented as, a, as an American film. So you have Spanish and Italian actors being dubbed by American actors and it's set in America. Don't Open Till Christmas does not do that. It is very surface level British, uh, for sure, as we will see. And its makers do not strive to mask its national origins. And the main reason for this is a consequence of the production context and the personnel involved, the majority of whose bread and butter was British exploitation cinema. So unaccustomed, though that they were, uh, to the British market, it is likely that the US producers thought by recruiting industry stalwarts who understood the local market, an effective product could materialise. So this includes, for example, the screenwriter uh, of Don't Open Till Christmas, Derek Ford, who by the mid-1980s had made lots and lots of exploitation films, had written a lot, um, including films such as The Black Torment from the 1960s, A Study in Terror, uh, Corruption, which is Peter Cushing's most controversial film, incidentally, um, Primitive London, as well as a, um, a, a documentary about um, swingers called The Wife Swappers. Um, and he'd also shot the, one of the first British hardcore pornographic films as well, a film called Diversions, or uh, Sex Express, as it's known, because it's set on a train. Um, so Derek Ford was very much um, sort of a, a key component in domestic exploitation film production in Britain. But he was also known to the producers of Don't Open Till Christmas as well, because Steve Manasian, in the early 1970s, had distributed this film, The House That Vanished, which Derek Ford um, was, a, was a writer on. And I'm going to show you the trailer for The House That Vanished now, um, as you can see here, it was promoted not as a sequel to Last House on the Left, but it was marketed in the same way. The films could not be 
more different. But anyway, here's a clip from, well, the trailer for The House That Vanished to give you a flavour of, of, um, of what Derek Ford had been doing up until this point. Too soon to talk about the summer of 72, that time when Paul and Valerie fell in love at first sight and went right out looking for a place to have an affair. And kept looking until they found the house that vanished. <laughs> From the company that reminds you, it's only a movie, only a movie, only a movie, only a movie. Now, of course, famously, the only a movie tagline, as we know, is the last house on the left tagline. So clearly, Steve Manasian was milking that cow, for want of a, a better expression. So the, the likes of Derek Ford and other members of the crew, from the perspective of the, the film's producers, were well positioned to understand the workings of the local market to accommodate a film like Don't Open Till Christmas, while also having an awareness for the potential of such a film in foreign territories. Indeed, the director of photography, a man called Alan Pudney, who's not a famous name, had in recent years worked on numerous British films such as Keep It Up Downstairs, it's a British sex comedy, loads of these in the 70s, the thriller Double Exposure, as well as the horror film Scream Time, the co-director and writer, a guy called Alan Birkinshaw, who works under the pseudonym Al McGowan, he had directed a controversial British film called Killer's Moon, which is essentially a more violent version of A Clockwork Orange that was um, released theatrically in Britain only, but which had a very healthy life on video overseas. And lastly, um, a gentleman by the name of Des Dolan. Now, Des Dolan hasn't really done much since, but at the time, as well as being sort of involved in, in, in record uh, production, producing, he was also the owner of the Go Video Company, which essentially initiated the Video Nasties panic by releasing Cannibal Holocaust on VHS in Britain in the 1980s. So Don't Open Till Christmas as a consequence, quite coincidentally, is a who's who of controversial British-related horror film exploitation um, things. And I think that shows in the film itself. Um, and that's what we're about to talk to now. So a consequence of, of pooling from such talent is that the film shares its spirit with popular British cinema of recent memory. Its action takes place in, in central London, an appropriate locale for the unfurling of horrific and otherwise unseemly activities that audiences of popular cinema were very much used to. And as the academic Charlotte Brunsden remarks, cinematic London has over the years been shaped in a direct sense by the horror film, more so than any other genre. And as such, tends to be Victorian in its presentation, drawing from imagery long associated with the city's dark past, namely the killings of, of Jack the Ripper. And similarly, Richard Dyer notes that the pervasiveness of London-centred mythology, such as that of Jack the Ripper, quote, contributes strongly to an image of London as a perpetually Victorian city where murder is committed in labyrinthine alleyways. By setting the action in inner London, and indeed by showing numerous killings in the city's shadow, don't open till Christmas exploits this mythology. So for example, the presence of the capital's sex industry, which is shown in a scene, and we, we saw a little bit of it in the trailer, where a man who's dressed as Santa Claus um, is murdered while he enjoys a, a strip tease, uh, and signified elsewhere by flashing lights adorning the marquees of sex cinemas and strip booths, these sequences anchor Don't Open Till Christmas to numerous exploitation films of the period. So I'm going to show you the clip from Don't Open Till Christmas where the Santa Claus is murdered, and then I'll talk a little bit about the films that Don't Open Till Christmas seems to be riffing on um, through its depiction of, for example, the sex industry in London. Note also the funky soundtrack, yeah? We're in classy territory. Yes, I can hear you. Hello? Oh, yes. So I think there's a delay, so we'll just skip the... But anyway, what happens was, they have a chat, and then he's stabbed in the neck, and it's very, very horrifying, 
and you're not going to get to see it. I'm sorry. But this sequence, which is, well, it's, it's sleazy, deliberately so, it's grim and grimy. Um, this seems to be referencing earlier films that were very, very successful for British producers of exploitation cinema, such as The Playbirds from 1978. Has anybody seen this film, out of curiosity? I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised, like I say, like these were popular most in, in, in Britain. I recommend you, you check it out. It's set in the sex industry in Soho in, in, in Britain, and it's about a, a faceless killer who, who goes around killing, um, killing sex workers and, and, and such like. What's significant about it for the purposes of this discussion, well, is the fact that it's set in Soho, but also it features this actor, Pat Astley, who was a, um, sort of a recurring feature of British sex films, and she also appears in Don't Open Till Christmas, where she's threatened uh, by um, the man who I likened to Russ Hunter earlier. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is clearly a connection made to earlier British exploitation films. Similarly, there are references to this film, Night After Night After Night, which is um, a film set in London again, uh, and you have uh, a masked killer killing permissive youths in the city, and uh, spoiler alert, it turns out to be the local judge <laughs> who uh, wants to curb crime in the city. But also, there are um, other European films that were also set in London in and around um, Soho, such as Cold Eyes of Fear, for instance, um, All the Colours of the Dark, um, and Dr. Jekyll meets the werewolf, which um, for um, international audiences are trying to sell London as an, as an exotic, an exotic place. It's quite a cosmopolitan, quite, quite a cosmopolitan uh, notion. Don't Open Till Christmas, I think, speaks to this drive towards cosmopolitanism, albeit as a British horror film, and it's surely indebted to the increased visibility of London, not only as a site of tourism, but also as a destination for largely businessmen who wanted to experience it, the sex industry in London. Um, you know, historically, Places like Amsterdam or whatever are, are, are held up as the go-to places for, for such things. But London in the 1970s was also garnering um, such a reputation. And indeed, we see it here. So in the first scene, two people are killed. Um, and then in the, in the subsequent scene, it's revealed as happening in, 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 in Soho. Santa slain in, in Soho, which I think is, um, is, is super, super interesting. Now, in doing so, the film builds on a mythology of London as a city of sin in a manner comparable to how US films such as Maniac, Nightmare, and Basket Case did for New York City. These films are sat in and around the Times Square area, 42nd Street, and so on, and they really do buy into the notion that New York has this sleazy, seedy underbelly, which is a perfect setting, of course, for a horror film. But also, um, Don't Open Till Christmas seems to be speaking to earlier British films which were trying to do a similar thing by showcasing London as a place of, um, a city of vice, a city of sin and hedonism such as West End Jungle, which is a sort of a fake documentary about uh, sex work in the city. London in the raw, the world's greatest city laid bare and of course, primitive London as well. Now in this way, the film appears to speak at once to domestic conceptions of what British exploitation cinema is, while embodying the touristic appeal of the capital city as a means of addressing international audiences. Don't Open, like the earlier pieces, builds on this, but brings ingredients from American films, such as the, the, the slasher cycle. So in a manner comparable to Friday the 13th, for example, it presents a shadowy killer pursuing in individuals which bear some relation to a significant past event which has triggered the antagonist's homicidal pursuit. So as in Friday the 13th, for example, we all know the story. Jason's mother traumatized Jason was killed at the camp. She returns to the camp to take vengeance on the, on the camp counselors. Something similar happens in Don't Open Until Christmas where the killer, um, as a child, witnessed his father dressed as Santa Claus having an affair. <laughs> And that means that this guy now has a vendetta against all Santa Clauses everywhere. And he, and he, hates, um, and he hates Christmas as a consequence. Now, the film is peppered with the language of the slasher film, such as lingering shots of the killer's point of view, 
replete with the sounds of heavy breathing and a litany of scenes in which the killer submits his victims to close proximity assaults. Uh, and if I have time, do I have time to show a clip? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, well, I'll show a clip and then I'll uh, wrap up. So this is the first, um, this, is the, the, the fil this is the film's opening scene. I'm late, darling. example of how Don't Open Till Christmas riffs on the whole slash of things, but there, I mean, there are countless examples, visual references to films like Happy Birthday to Me, for instance, and in fact, the title sequence, which I won't show you, is essentially lifted wholesale from Halloween 2. I mean, it's plagiarism, <laughs> really. Uh, I've got time. I, I actually don't have the clip with me, but that's, that's fine. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> have you got 90 minutes and I'll go and download it? <laughs> that's all right. Um, but also references to Christmas Evil, which is an earlier... Christmas-themed horror film, and again, the killer in that film is similarly traumatized by witnessing his mother this time engage in sexual activity with his father while dressed as Santa Claus. Lots of Freudian imagery here that we just don't have time to discuss, I'm afraid. Um, I'll conclude, I'll, I'll take about three minutes if that's okay, just to talk a little bit about Don't Open Till Christmas on video, because this is where it really did see its, um, its success. In America especially, um, the market for splatter movies, violent slasher movies, um, was especially buoyant. And companies such as, independent companies such as Wizard Video really made a splash by releasing films such as I Spit in Your Grave, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Zombie, and so on, um, to lucrative returns. And in 1982, it's been said in the trade press that I Spit in Your Grave actually outsold that year's Oscar winner on video. So there was clearly a large market for films that were very, very cheap to produce. And Don't Open Till Christmas certainly owes its success to, to a context whereby films such as The Mutilator, um, Final Terror, The Children and so on were released and doing huge numbers for their distributors. Now I'm just going to skip this quote because it's, um, it's very, very dull. So Don't Open Till Christmas did very, very good money on video in the States in 1985, but it was also sold the world over. Italy, Iceland, um, South America. Um, it did very, very good business. Um, and it garnered some controversy, in fact, when it was released on video in West Germany in 1989. Now, I started this presentation by talking about how, how little known these films are. 
um, these British films of the 1980s are um, in comparison to, say, films of the Hammer tradition. Well, Don't Know Until Christmas, when it was released on video in West Germany, was banned, in fact, due to um, violence against women, which there is not a lot of in the film, actually. But I've got a feeling that the front cover for the video probably had something to do with it. But what is especially interesting, from my perspective, at least, is um, nowhere else did this happen, but on German VHS, so controversial was Don't Open Till Christmas that the distributors, Ufa, actually retitled a Greek Christmas-themed comedy as Don't Open Till Christmas Part 2. So whereas these films are largely forgotten, whereas these films are largely not talked about, they did have a life, people did see them, and in territories such as West Germany, um, they made considerable money for, for British film producers. Um, thanks for listening, um, everyone. Uh, if I don't see you beforehand, uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs>